I, uh, I discovered this book and uh, picked it up off the shelf in a bookshop and, and started to read it and found myself standing there 20, 30 minutes later still reading it. And that's when I discovered Judith Dupre and learned that she, in fact, had a uh, terrific way of writing about architecture in a way that was instructive and, and delightful. Um, but, but here's the unusual thing, and that really kind of persuaded me to get in touch with you, is that uh, after uh, doing, in fact, three such books, there's another one on bridges and so on, uh, Judith enrolled in the School of Divinity at Yale University. That surprised me, and I wonder if you'd come out here and tell us why. Thank you. Moses, thanks for that nice introduction. I am delighted to be here. I'm especially happy to be here with my son, Brendan, who's in the second row. He's 18, and he's about to start at McGill University in the fall. <laughs> he's becoming a true Canuck, and I couldn't be happier. <laughs> you know, listening to the speakers, listening to you, you know, we all want the same thing. We want our brief time here on earth to have meaning. When I interviewed the late, great architect, Philip Johnson, he was 92 years old, and he has built skyscrapers and churches and synagogues and houses all over the world, and they are, they are true icons. And I said, Philip, what's the secret to life? And he... It, is a mischievous boy, an irreverent bad boy, if there ever was one. And he said, always try to get some fun in. Always try to get some fun in. And to that, I would add, always try to get some art in. I will share a piece of art. This is by my friend Karen Ostrom. She's a New York-based, British Columbia-born uh, photographer and filmmaker, an amazing artist. And when I saw this piece, it's really a meditation. It's kind of like the Seinfeld show, nothing happens. It's just the feeling, I wanted to give you the feeling that you get when you're in an airplane, when you're not home any longer, but you're not at your final destination. You're not here, you're not there. And there is an in-between feeling when you're on an airplane. As human beings, we live on the earth, but we know, either by faith or instinct, that we belong to an eternal continuum, that there is something greater than us out there. Now, I have another son. He's younger, and he loves to give me pop quizzes, on-the-spot tests, and the only thing I can imagine is the poor kid gets these in school, so he needs to pass them on to me. One day, he comes up to me and says, Mom, other than oxygen, what do human beings need to survive? And I thought, okay, um, water? No. And then I thought, food? You're wrong. And he was grinning because he's triumphant because he knew he had me stumped. Well, it turns out that in most climates, what we as human beings need to survive is shelter. And that really got me thinking. I thought, wow, what if people felt as comfortable with shelter as we do with, say, um, food? We all know what we like to eat. We all know what we don't like. Most of us can navigate our way around a menu, whether at, we're at McDonald's or uh, the Four Seasons. Thanks to our event sponsors, we've just discovered we have a taste for pomegranate-infused cashews. <laughs> 
My work is about welcoming the public into a conversation about shelter and by extension architecture uh, through my books and through the work I do consulting on large scale uh, public projects. I help people see the wonders of the world. Now, I wasn't planning on speaking about skyscrapers. Thank you so much, Moses. Moses showed you a tiny paperback version of that book. The actual book uh, you know, is, much, is much, much larger. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking on skyscrapers. That feels like ancient history. That was um, five books ago for me. I wanted to talk about my new book on the Virgin Mary. And, but after Wednesday's talks about the demise of the male and the rise of the female, I thought, wow, how perfect is this? I've written this big book about phallic buildings, 99% of them designed by men. Um, you know, everyone who worked on that skyscraper book got pregnant, including me. So many people got pregnant that we nicknamed it the Big Prick Book. <laughs> And you know, it's funny because pretty much everyone who works with me on a book gets pregnant. So I don't, I, I, it makes me feel good. All the creative juices of every sort are flowing. You know, I sometimes think, gosh, I should start a literary fertility uh, agency. <laughs> anyway, but from a big uh, book on um, skyscrapers to my new book, which is about a woman who conceived a child without male sperm. So I really felt like Wednesday just followed the arc of my work of the last two decades. But I do want to talk about a few trends in skyscrapers. You know, there's been a lot of rules are being broken right now as we got from Rachel's incredible talk. I love that, Rachel. Um, one of the unbreakable rules is the idea of context, that a building needs to respond to the other buildings on the site. It needs to respond to the fabric of the city, the street facade needs to be uniform, and materials need to be, if not identical, harmonious. That rule is being broken by something called signature buildings. Um, it, uh, Frank Gehry, Canadian-born genius architect, Frank Gehry designed the Bilbao Museum in Spain. And that was such an unusual building. It absolutely broke with its sleepy surroundings. And that became, that, that spawned the, the phrase, the Bilbao effect, any distinctive building that breaks with its surroundings. This is not a new idea. Think of the Eiffel Tower. Think of the Great Pyramids at Giza. But boy, think about what is right next door to us, the Royal Ontario Museum. Royal Ontario Museum, when I knew we were going to be speaking next to the ROM, incredible. Daniel Liebeskin's building is extraordinary. If you haven't been in there, if you're visiting, run. It is one of the most significant buildings that has been built um, in recent memory. And you know, would you say, is that a skyscraper? It's really not that tall. I would maintain it is a skyscraper because of its intention. Look at that building, it points to the sky. It is arising from the sidewalk. An incredible, incredible building. You see, skyscrapers establish identity. They are about power. The big power always builds the big buildings. Now, in Mexico, outside of Mexico City, you can, you can go to Teotihuacan, and this is um, an incredible city built by the Aztec, Aztecs years ago. The Teo is divided down its center by a main avenue. On the north end of this avenue is the Pyramid of the Sun. The sun, the, that pyramid responds and is aligned to the movements of the sun. And at the other end of the avenue, you, you see the Pyramid of the Moon. Just behind the period of, Pyramid of the Moon, there is a mountain. And when you look at the pyramid, you realize its silhouette follows the shape of the mountain behind it. What the ancients understood was that the power, their power, and the powers, power of their gods came from nature, came from the land. 
there's a new kind of contextualism that's happening, global contextualism, where skyscrapers are relating to the sun with solar panels. They are harvesting wind with wind term terminals, turbines, excuse me. And they are responding to the mountains, geothermal energy. Um, and it seems, it's so interesting to me to think of the ancient Aztecs and builders all over uh, the ancient world, that they knew secrets that we are now incorporating into state-of-the-art skyscrapers. One of the good things, if, if you track skyscrapers, you'll know that many of them are going up in the Middle East. Why? It's a blank slate. There is nothing there. And the good thing about skyscrapers being built in this extreme climate is that it is an extreme climate. We are getting to test the outer limits of what is possible in extreme heat, without water, and in, in extreme wind. Skyscrapers are enormously expensive to build. St the cost of steel is outrageous. I am so excited to hear talks like Rachel's because they talk about, you know, there are all these new composite materials that are being made that will reduce the cost of skyscrapers. Skyscrapers are energy hogs, they are polluters. But, 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 in the face of population growth, they might be the best solution to house tens of thousands of people. You can create great density with a skyscraper. You can put many people in a building and really, and, and have them have a community and be able to get around using uh, public transportation. Another thing that we're seeing in architecture is the presence of simultaneity. And this is the provision of multiple architectural experiences. Last month I was in Berlin and I was in Norman Foster's new glass dome on top of the Reichstag. And you can look up to the sky through the dome, you can look across to the Berlin skyline, you can look down into the atrium and see other people spiraling up the staircases. There's all these different kinds of experiences that are available in the building. And it all hinges on individual perception. My perception of that building is going to be different than yours. Now, Foster's work, he is known for creating opportunities for human interaction in his building. He is aware that one of the greatest social ills is one of loneliness. And he is doing amazing work in that area, as are many other architects and social anthropologists. My own books partake of simultaneity, too. Their pages are full of photographs, deep captions, timelines. Of course, we have a traditional narrative. You can start the book at the end. You can start it in the middle. You can start it at the beginning. You can go left to right. You can go up, to, up and down. So I write about architecture, but I'm also very interested in the thingliness of a book. I love books. I have had a lifelong love affair with books. But maybe even more than I'm interested in books, I'm interested in how we read. How do we get information? So, you know, there are lots of possibilities right now. My the first edition of Skyscrapers, I began that in 1994, well before most people were online. And what I'm finding now is that the internet has made my book designs obsolete. They're still beautiful things, but people really have become very savvy about ways that they get information. In terms of my own writing and why I went to Yale Divinity School, which might be a title of a future book. Um, I wanted to know, when I wrote a book on church architecture, I wanted to know about the faith and the belief and the theology that brought cathedrals, our very first skyscrapers, into being. I needed to walk the walk. And I've been at Yale for five years now, and I've learned a lot. Probably primarily I've learned that 
as interesting as, as gargoyles and apses and ambos and all those components of spiritual architecture, religious architecture are, they're not as interesting to me as what happens on the ground between people. I've really become interested in that, in that um, God, creator, other, that lives from Monday through Saturday. You know, the thing about a skyscraper is, if you're standing on a sidewalk, you cannot see the top of the skyscraper. You know it's there, you know? What has become very precious and what I have become passionately devoted to is the creating structures and situations that uphold the dignity of the human spirit. And that is what I have been working on. And it's causing me to have far more patience. It's demanding that I have patience that I don't possess. My son can confirm I'm one of, <laughs> I'm a doing person and waiting and taking the journey and being in the plane and that not yet there-ness is excruciating for those of us who do. But you know, transformation is, uh, requires surrender. And it doesn't always follow, you know. You do one thing and it leads to the next and it leads to the next and to the next person and to the next idea. Sometimes there is a radical split between your life and the next part of your life. And when you're in a place like that, it takes, it takes a lot of grace. It takes a willingness to wait for clarity. I've had to surrender a lot in this last year, and I am slowly beginning to embrace that threshold, the ambiguous threshold that I'm on right now. All I can tell you is try to get some fun in and try to get some art in and absolutely get a lot of kindness in. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, I, I actually did uh, buy eventually that big, tall, original hardcover. You need, you need, it's actually yes. bigger than that. You need yeah. the big one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just uh, I've got that at home, and, and this morning I ran up to the bookstore and I grabbed what I could. Yeah. Oh, but thank you. It's a splendid book. I hope to get you to autograph it one day. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much, Judith. Thank you. Yeah. Great. My eyes open. Done. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks